In our last video, we looked at properties of waves. And one of the properties is that waves can interfere with other waves. They can occupy the same place at the same time. And another property of waves we looked at is that they will propagate energy from one place to another. You drop a rock in here, the wave is just going to spread out indefinitely as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we can see the waves moving along the surface. But there's another kind of wave we want to look at, and that is called a standing wave. It is a wave that just appears to just bob up and down in place and doesn't really appear to be going forward or back, left or right. It just appears to be going up and down. And to understand that will help us understand how musical instruments work, like guitars. And as we proceed through this unit, we're going to learn how um, wind instruments that have sound inside tubes are going to work as well. So one basic idea is that if we have a medium, and remember that's the material the wave passes through, and right now the ends of that medium are free. Nothing's holding them in place. Let's, let's, see, let's see what happens when a wave goes down, trough goes down, and trough comes back. Well, to understand that, we have to remember that waves transfer energy. If energy is going down the length of this and reaches the end of the medium, the energy just can't evaporate. The energy has to go somewhere. It can't go to the right, so all that energy just comes back into the medium. But notice a trough went down and a trough came back. The ends of the medium were free. And it's just like this tuning fork here. The length of that rod is not held down here. It's free. It's kind of fixed over here because it's attached to the rest of the thing. But it's free here. Let's look what happens if we held the end of the medium down with that little clip there. If a trough goes down, it hits that clip and it gets thrown up. A trough came in and a crest came back. And we can understand that with Newton's third law of motion, that these rods were pushing the clip down, and in return, the reaction would be the clip would push these rods up. That's why it flipped like that. So guitar strings are mediums where the ends of the mediums are held down, just like this medium was held down right there. And back to this tuning fork, this end of it was held down because it's firmly attached to all that stuff that you're holding on to with your hand there. So if I send a trough and a crest down, a trough and a crest are going to come back. But when they come back to my hand, I can feel it trying to push my hand. I can feel when the trough comes back because it's pushing my hand down and a, a crest coming back, it's going to push my hand up. Instead of making just one wave with a crest and a trough, let me continue to make waves. There'll be a whole series of waves going down, and then pretty soon there'll be a whole series of waves coming back. Now I'm still making waves. There's waves going down, and there's waves coming back. And if I do it correctly, meaning I move my hand up and down at the right frequency to produce the right wavelength, a standing wave will occur. And standing waves have places that are going up and down, we call those antinodes, and then places that are just staying still, we call those nodes. So let's see what I mean by moving my hand up and down correctly. Let's say this is a medium of a certain length. It's free on this end and it's free on this end. And I make a wave that comes down like this and it reaches the end there. That wave is going to bounce and come back. Now remember with free ends, it does not flip the wave. If a crest comes in, a crest goes back. But this crest here was heading down like this. And it's not going to flip anything, it's just going to turn it around. So the wave that returns would be just 
continue heading down like that and return. Notice that the wave that returned was not quite in step with the wave that was made right there. If, if this end had been fixed, this wave here would have flipped up like that and it would have returned flipping up like that. So that's the wavelength that didn't quite work. It didn't quite make things in step. If I make a wavelength that's just a little longer so that this was the original wavelength, now this is a wavelength that's just a little longer, that wave might hit right up there at a crest and when it bounces and returns, it's just going to come back nicely in step with the wave that was advancing. So this red wave would be traveling to the left, the orange wave would be traveling to the right, and those two waves would be in step with each other, meaning when I'm moving my hand down to make the trough of the red wave, the trough of the orange wave would return, be returning right at that moment. And what happens is you get these two waves. One is traveling to the left, one is traveling to the right, and they will interfere with each other and produce a standing wave. So the blue wave is traveling to the left, the red wave is traveling to the right, the black wave is just the resultant of those two, crest on crest, or crest on trough, destructive interference, but we see we have anti-nodes here, here, there, and over here. We have nodes right here, and a node there, and there, and there, and there, and that's a standing wave. It just bobs up and down uh, in place. The resultant doesn't really look like it's heading left or right. Now one thing to notice about that is that the wavelength of the resultant it has the same wavelength as the individual waves that were making it. So let's see what happens. Let's see if we can figure out which of these two situations is the medium free at both ends or which one is fixed at both ends. If we watch this crest coming in, crest coming in, boop, crest comes back, crest comes back. Or if I watch this trough coming in, trough coming in, boop, trough comes back. You can see it didn't flip it. And what happens is, and that if it didn't flip it, that would be for a free end reflection. You get trough on trough, and you get this resultant going with constructive interference really high and really low. On this one, the crest comes in and the trough returned. If we follow this blue one, trough comes in, trough comes in, and crest comes back. It flipped it. But notice that the resultant doesn't move right there at the end. We have a node right there, which is fine because it's held down right there and right there. It's fixed. Here, it's moving wildly up and down, but that's okay because it was free at both ends. So now what we want to do is try to figure out what wavelengths will make standing waves. What wavelengths will make the two waves in step with each other? So I just have a spring attached to the wall there, and my hand is providing just a little bit of energy, but my hand is holding that. So it's fixed here and it's fixed there. It has to be at a node where it's fixed and another node where it's fixed here. If the distance from me to the wall is 12 feet, what's that wavelength? It's not 12 feet. That is only half of a wave. Going from one node to the next node is just half a wavelength. The other half would go to a trough and back to a node. So half of a wavelength is 12 feet. The whole wavelength must be twice that. If this is 12, that's going to be 12, so the whole thing is 24 feet. The wavelength of the largest one that fits is called the first harmonic. It's also called the fundamental frequency. That's the largest one that fits. The fundamental frequency, or also known as the first harmonic. And we have one half of a wavelength fitting in there. This is the next largest one that fits. Okay, this, what's the wavelength of this? It has two anti-nodes. 
Well, we can see that a whole wave is 12 feet, so the whole wave is 12 feet, but it's better to keep track of half wavelengths. The first one was half a wavelength equaling 12 feet. Now we fit two halves in there. So 12 into two equal parts, each half is six feet. And if half a wavelength is six feet, then clearly the whole thing is 12 feet. Okay, now why did I go to that trouble of counting half wavelengths? Well, let's look at the next largest one that fits, and that will answer our, our question. This one's bobbing up and down. It has an anti-node here, there, and there. It has three anti-nodes, but this is half a wavelength, that's half a wavelength, and that's half a wavelength. The next largest one that fits is called the third harmonic, or the second overtone. I forgot to say that the second harmonic was the first overtone. But 12 divided by three equal parts, each part is four feet. So if half of a wavelength is four feet, then the whole thing is gonna be eight feet. We need to keep track of half wavelengths. This fit three halves. The next largest one is gonna fit four halves. So four halves fitting into there, 12 divided by four, each half is three feet. So the whole thing would be six feet. That was four halves fitting into there, and that was the fourth harmonic, the third overtone. The next largest one is gonna be the fifth harmonic, the fourth overtone, and that's gonna fit in one, two, three, four, five halves. And it gets kind of crazy, but there's our five halves. So 12 divided by five, half a wavelength is 2.4. That makes the whole wavelength twice that, or 4.8. An equation that will calculate that for us, so that we don't need to memorize that, is we took the length of it and divided by how many halves we're gonna fit into there. So in this case, it was five halves. We took 12 and we divided by five. That would tell us what half a wavelength is, but if I multiply by two, that would give us the whole wavelength. So these are a whole variety of different wavelengths that could fit on a string that is fixed at both ends. This blue one is the fundamental, or the first harmonic. This red one is the second harmonic, or the first overtone, and so on and so forth. Now, if I just take a string and I pluck that string, which of these do you think is gonna happen on that string? Well, all of them are gonna happen. All of those waves are gonna happen at one time. And the string will move as the resultant of all those waves happening at one time. Remember, wave, more than one wave can be on the medium at any one time. That line there is pretty easy to figure out because you can just do it in a spreadsheet if this is the amplitude of the different harmonics, the resultant is just the sum of all the amplitudes, because the energy is found in the amplitude. Now, there's different ways that those strings could vibrate with various amplitudes. For example, a string could vibrate with an amplitude of this first harmonic, and another string could have the same amplitude of that first harmonic. But notice in this one here, the first overtone, the second harmonic, is pretty large, but it's smaller in this one. And then like here, this purple one is really small amplitude, but here this purple one had a larger amplitude. That's gonna make the overall string sound a little different. And that's what happens when we have different strings on different instruments. They both have the same fundamental frequency, so they're gonna have the same overall tone. So if I play the sound of a piano, that sound is, has the same fundamental frequency as a violin here. Strings are vibrating back and forth just like um, with the same fundamental frequency. The reason they sound different 
is because the amplitudes of the harmonics are different in each sound. If I play this sound here, that's just the wavelength, the fundamental frequency with no harmonics. It doesn't have much quality to it. So the quality comes in with the mixing in of the other harmonics, the other uh, wavelengths that could fit. Now the other thing is the string's not going to be frozen in that position. Remember waves transfer energy. They're going to be moving like this. So this is how a string of a piano might wiggle as it's plucked or hammered. And this is how this string of a violin might move. Subtle differences. The blue one here and the blue one here are vibrating at the same frequency, but the loudness or the amplitudes of the other harmonics make it wiggle just a little different. And all those waves are present at one time. So if I have a guitar here and I just pluck that string, that string could vibrate in a variety of different ways. One way is just having an anti-node right in the middle and a node here and a node here. If I measure from here to here, it's 64 centimeters. Well, half a wavelength is 64. The wavelength of the fundamental, or the first harmonic, is twice that, 128 centimeters. And that string there is the note E. It vibrates at 82.41 hertz. So if I know the frequency and I know the wavelength, I could find out how fast those waves are moving back and forth on that string, about 10.5 meters per second. If I tighten that string, I can make them move faster. It wouldn't change the wavelength, it would change the frequency. Another way that string could vibrate is having a node right here in the middle, and half a wavelength is 32, so the whole wavelength is twice that. Another way that string could vibrate is with a node here and a node there. Half a wavelength is going to be one-third of that, or 21.33, but it would also have a node over here. So the whole wavelength is going to be, if half a wavelength is that, the whole thing's twice that. Another way that string could vibrate is with nodes here, there, and there, and that would be 16 uh, centimeters altogether. That's 64 divided by 4. Or the, and it would also have a node over here. Now if I just hold right there in the middle, and if I pluck here but hold it right there, I'm going to prevent the green and the blue ones from moving because they're trying to move there and I'm holding it down there. If I hold right here, I'm going to prevent all the other waves except the green one which has a node right there and a node right there. Let me show you what I mean. picture here you can see that as the string vibrates it had a node right there. Now if I held lightly in the middle only waves that had nodes right there in the middle could get set up. I'd prevent the first harmonic and the third and the fifth and the seventh. I would um, prevent all the odd harmonics and the string would vibrate like that. All right now let's look at strings that vibrate um, well, it wouldn't be a string, it would be, have to be a stiffer object, like a rod, that's not held at the ends, it's free at the ends. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. It's just the same thing as we did before, but this time going from an anti-node to an anti-node, or from crest to trough, is just half a wavelength. If half a wavelength is 9 feet, then the first harmonic must have been 18 feet. Another way that's rod could vibrate free here and free here is having a node there and a node there but this is half a wavelength and this is another half wavelength we have two halves again we're going to keep track of half wavelengths so if half a wavelength is 4.5 the whole thing was nine so instead of fitting two halves let's fit in one two three halves 
9 divided by 3, each half is 3, so the whole thing must be 6. Instead of 3 halves, let's fit in 4 halves. 12, 9 divided by 4 is 4 and a quarter. Half a wavelength is 4 and a quarter, so the whole wavelength must be twice that. Instead of 4 halves, let's fit in 5 halves. 9 divided by 5 is 8 is 1.8 with some decimals. Oh no, no decimals, I think. And um, but if half a wavelength is 1.8, the whole thing must be twice that. And then instead of five halves, let's fit in six halves. If half a wavelength is 1.5, that's 9 divided by 6, the whole wavelength must have been 3 feet. Okay? And that's just the same equation as before. We took the length divided by the number of halves and then multiplied by 2 to find the whole wavelength. These were a variety of different waves that could happen on a rod that's free on this end and free on this end. And if I just hold, or if I don't hold the rod and just smack it against the ground, not holding it anywhere, all of those waves are going to happen at one time and more. And it's going to sound awful. But if I hold in the middle, the black, blue, and green waves all have nodes right there in the middle. So only those waves could continue to go. The red and the gray and the violet didn't have nodes right there, so I would stop those. And you could hold at different nodes, like this. Okay, so that's all the waves. Now I just hold in the middle. There's three notes. And then I'm going to hold the black and go there. Then I'm going to hold the blue or the violet ones there. Then I'm going to hold the blue nodes, the gray or the white. And I can get a variety of different notes on that one as long as I hold it right where a node is. And wind chimes. I don't know if you've ever tried to make wind chimes before, but if you just take a piece of metal like this and hold it right here in the end and whack it, it is not going to sound like a wind chime at all. You have to hold it where there's nodes. So if this is the length of a pipe there, one of the waves that could happen on there is a full wavelength, two halves. So it would have a node there and a node there. So what they've done is they've drilled a hole right through a quarter of the length of the whole thing and holding it right there. That way when the wood hits that, the string isn't going to stop it from vibrating because it's not really vibrating there anyway. Okay. And a xylophone, same thing here. These holes are drilled in these pieces of wood one quarter the way in so that it is, they're held at nodes. All right, we're not quite done with that because we looked at waves that were fixed at both ends like a string waves that were free at both ends, like a rod. But here is a rod that is free at one end and fixed at another. Just like my tuning fork was free at that end and held down with our hand and everything down here. So let's go through this again and keep track of wavelengths that would make standing waves where it is free at one end and fixed at the other. Let's say that from there to there is 15 centimeters. What's this wavelength? Well, what fraction of a wavelength is it? Going from node, crest, node, trough, node is one whole wavelength. We only went from a node to an anti-node. That's just a quarter of a wavelength. So if a quarter of a wavelength is 15 centimeters, the whole thing must have been four times that because that would be 15, 15, 15, and 15. All right, so the largest one that fits, the first harmonic, is going to be one quarter of a wavelength. What fraction is going to be the next largest one? Well, it still has to end at an anti-node where it's free and end at a node where it's fixed. And the one that does that is instead of starting an anti-node and stopping at the first node, we add in another half wavelength and end at this node. So what we've done is we've broken up into three quarters of a wavelength. 
This time we have to keep track of quarter wavelengths. So 15 was broken up into three equal parts. Each part was a quarter of a wavelength. So the whole thing must have been th um, four times that. Four times five is 20. So the, the first harmonic was fitting in one quarter. The second harmonic was fitting in three quarters because we fit in one more half wavelength or two more quarters. The next largest one is going to not stop at this node. We're going to fit in one more half wavelength or two more quarters. Five quarters altogether. One, two, three, four, five quarters. So 15 divided evenly five times. Each part is three centimeters. So what's this wavelength? Well, a quarter is equal to three, so the whole is going to be four times that. So instead of five quarters, the next one's going to be seven quarters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven quarters. 15 divided by seven is 2.14. 2.14 times four is that. Okay, instead of seven quarters, we could fit nine quarters in there. We're just squeezing in two more quarters or another half because it had to end at a node and now it ends at this node. So 15 divided by nine and then times four. What we did is this is just a fancy way of in, um, getting um, odd multiples, one, three, five, seven, but we just took it divided by how many quarters fit in there and then multiplied by four to find the whole wavelength. No need to memorize that one. Okay, um, so with this one, this rod is fixed here. The fundamental frequency, the first harmonic, is the number that's stamped there, 512 hertz. And one way that could be is just vibrating back and forth like this, free there and fixed right there. But another way that could vibrate is instead of one quarter, we fit three quarters. There's a quarter, there's a quarter, and there's a quarter. So that's another way that rod could vibrate. In fact, it is vibrating um, both ways at the same time. So how does this wavelength of the green compare? The wavelength of that green is going to be one-third the wavelength of this blue because three quarters fit into the same distance as just one quarter. It must have been one-third as big. So if the wavelength is one-third as big, the frequency must have been three times as big. So this another note that could come off that tuning fork is 1536 hertz. Pretty wild. Okay, it would vibrate like that. One last thing we want to cover here is just we've looked at strings fixed at both ends, rods free at both ends, rods fixed at one end, free at another. Well, let's now take a rod and bend that all the way around till it's a circle. So let's find standing waves on circles. Like if you ding this bowl here or you flick this cup and ding it, it's going to sing a note. So here's what the thing looks like. And that has a particular circumference based upon its radius. One wave that could go all the way around here, if it starts here and goes all the way around, it has to end at the same place. So the only way, the, the largest one that will do that is if it starts at a crest, goes through a node, hits a trough, goes through a node and ends back at a crest. It goes from crest to crest. That's just one wavelength. So the circumference of that is two pi r. Two pi r fitting in one wavelength, the wavelength of the fundamental or the first harmonic must have been 15.7. Another way that could do it is fitting two full wavelengths, going from crest to trough, to crest to trough, back to a crest, is fitting in two waves into the circumference. So two pi r is the circumference, and then divide by two, that's the wavelength of the second harmonic. Another way would be fitting three full waves, crest, trough, crest, trough, crest, trough, back to a crest. 
So that circumference divided by 3 is that. Or another way is to fit four full waves into there. So the circumference divided by four full waves. And if you just ding a cup, all of those are happening at one time. And the rim of that cup moves as the resultant of that. And remember, waves are always in motion. This is just what it looks like at that moment. So to see what it looks like in reality, all those harmonics are there and the rim of the cup is moving in this very unique and complicated way, but it produces all those sounds, or I should say, all those sounds produce that resultant, and that rim of the cup is moving like that. Maybe not quite as exaggerated as that, because uh, the glass would break, but you can break glass uh, by singing into it, and that's, we'll save that for another video. That's standing waves on a variety of different mediums. Hope you enjoyed.